Mm-hmm. We made it to the Greeks. <laughs> we made it to the actual Greeks. The, the last set of slides was a precursor to the pre a classical Greek uh, civilization. So now we're going to talk about the Greeks. And first, we're going to start with some global connections, and then we'll start with some historical perspectives and social organization uh, of the Greeks. Let's look at this image, right? And this image is actually a, um, it is a statue dating back to between 640 and 630 um, BCE. And it's actually a image from Crete. And if we look at this image, it is strikingly similar to some of the images that we saw when we talked about ancient Egypt. And the the um, the depiction in this in this statue was a closely fitted dress that again looks like an Egyptian sheath. Um, there is a wide belt which we we see evidence, and the hair has the appearance of a uh, of a wig, right? We talked about how Egyptians Egyptians wore wigs, and you know this provides evidence of active contact between um, Greece and Egypt during this pre-classical Greek uh, Greek period. And, you know, such that this contact is, is going to lead to some of the things that we're going to see later, especially when we start talking about textile production and, and trade. But um, I love this image because it's a good bridge that even in the ancient world, we borrowed from each other, right? So when we, the, the further along we get in fashion history, we'll see how nothing new <laughs> is really invented, that we continually borrow, build, and evolve. Um, our choices, our styling, our fashion evolves on one, on, on one another. So this is a connection that we can make between Egyptian civilization and Minoan Mycenaean early Greek civilization. So let's talk about the Greeks now. And the image that you're seeing uh, is a statue that's in the Metropolitan Museum of Art in New York City. And it is a depiction of the goddess Nike. I hope you know that Nike is a goddess and not just a brand. Uh, if you Again, I'm, I'm, my background is history. So if you don't know about the goddess Nike, I'm going to tell you to go <laughs> to go and do your research use wikipedia for this right they'll have a good description but a depiction of the nike uh, the goddess nike and i this is one of my favorite statues um i've been to the i've met uh, more than a handful of times and i love it because even though this is a marble marble statue there is such movement movement in this in this fabric and um in the fabric depicted in stone right it feels like you can see the wind moving in this garment and it's made out of stone. It's, it's amazing. Um, so we're going to talk about the Greeks, right? Um, the Greeks, hopefully we all know, right, um, that they had some great intellectual achievements. And along with the Egyptians um, are considered, you know, the, some of the creators of Western society. And, you know, their achievements, you know, include you know, um, epic tales and a, a rich mythology of uh, of gods and goddesses. You know, there are poems, books really, but they're long poems um, from Homer, the Iliad and the Odyssey. They actually are long poems. I'm not sure if you're aware of that. Um, you know, there's stories about heroes of the Trojan War. Um, there in, in Homer's poems, and there was a contemporary historian at the time named Herodotus. Herodotus they they described the life and customs of the people, and they I'm going to tell a couple stories later. They actually have stories that talk about how women women dress. We're going to talk about that. Um, and you know, Greece's classical age. I've used that word a couple times, but the the period of time where Greece flourished is um, about 500 to, you know, about 320 BC. And that's considered their most creative era in the history of our developing Western civilization. And um, philosophers like Socrates and Plato and Aristotle, you know, pondered the nature of the universe and the meaning of life and ethical values, um, you know, 
plays were written by, you know, Sophocles. They wrote drama for um, the public that was that dealt with the nature and the fate of man. And the Greeks did develop history in my air quotes, right? That that literary form. Um, and we are still looking at the documents written by ancient Greek historians. And then, of course, um, you know, sculpture that glorified sculpture and art that glorified the human body using techniques out of marble, um, like the, the image depicted here, depicted here of Nike. So that's what we're going to talk about um, for the rest of this. We're going to talk about uh, about Greeks. We're going to talk about their social organization, of course, you know, fabric and clothing production. Um, we're going to talk a little bit about, of course, what what folks wore. Um, we're gonna. I have a couple good stories to tell you. So that's what we're gonna dive in for for the next bit bit of the lecture. Society at the time was made up of essentially nobilities and and commoners. And while Greece is known as the birthplace place of democracy. How that played in the politics is really um, is really unknown. So households were, you know, pretty much self-sufficient. They produced their own food. Uh, often they produced their own clothing and textile. Um, and you know, a man's home was quite literally his, his a fortress, right, protected by walls against folks who frequently attacked Greek settlements. Um, especially those settlements that were that were on the on the coastline. And in that classical age period that that we just talked about that 500 to about 300 B, you know BCE when we have documents that uh, were written in that period um, Greek communities had you know grown into city-states and are, had developed far more sophisticated uh, urban social um, social organization and the population of Athens which is the most famous city-state in in Greece consisted of men um, they were this active citizenry, right? They were the ones that were allowed to participate in whatever political system that existed um, and their dependent women and children, whatever foreigners lived there. And they did have they did have slaves. It was a different type of slavery than chattel slavery that uh, we think of in in common times. But, you know, in the classical age, women occupied a subordinate position and um, women absolutely <laughs> lacked political power and they had little control over over their own destinies and it had been it's been said um, it's been depicted as well in historical writings of the time that from birth to death they were under the control of some man right sounds familiar doesn't it <laughs> under the control of some man so even you know widow widows um, even though they, you know, kept their, were able to own property, that property still had to be supervised by a male relative. Marriages were often arranged and monogamy was the rule. Girls married at the age of about 14, which freaks me out. <laughs> As the mother of a 14 year old boy, uh, for him to be married now well, freaks me out. Uh, and men generally were um, married a little bit older, um, but Part of the reason why girls are married so young is because the lifespan for a woman was only about uh, to the age of 40. Um, so um, husbands, you know, they didn't consider wives or equals um, socially or, or intellect, intellectually. Um, and wives, wives, women were secluded in, in their household. Um, and they were responsible for the children, the food, and the clothing. And in the clothing, that's what this this is a this picture is a depiction of of what a typical household um, looks like. You know, they spun and wove fabrics and made the clothing, you know, for their family. They often, um, you know, cultivated and farmed the food. They tended to um, to livestock. We see a sheep here depicted. They educated the children. In this in this picture, one of the children is um, holding the, actually the second little boy. Or I'm going to say it's a little boy. Um, could be a girl is holding um, an instrument uh, known as a lute. And if you see, they all have you know some kind of grain or something in their hand. Uh, they also were responsible for trading with other women for the goods that they couldn't produce 
out of their own, out of their own homes. Spinning and weaving were considered occupations, even for queens and goddesses, right? So uh, we're going to talk about this image in a minute, but in um, one of the epic Greek poems written by Homer, it's called the Odyssey, um, Ulysses, unfaithful queen Penelope, hopefully you know, you may know this story, promises to choose a new, a new king after she's finished weaving a garment. And each day after she weaves the garment, she secretly unravels the garment in order to avoid ever taking a husband. <laughs> so, you know, we was we were slick back in the day. We were slick back in the day. But just the fact that there's a story about goddesses doing work, right? And that work is the production of textiles shows you how important textile production, uh, weaving and spinning was in everyday life. And additionally, Athena, the goddess of wisdom, the saint, the patroness of the city, the city of Athens is named after Athena. She was, um, is their patron goddess. She's also um, the patron of artisans. Um, she is credited in Greek mythology as the first woman to ever work with wool. So the cultivation of using wool and, um, you know, Athens still um, has a, a celebration that they do in honor of the goddess uh, Athena. Um, and it's centered around really magnificently patterned, uh, patterned garments. And sheep herding was actually practiced in the mountainous areas of the Greek peninsula. So not as much on the coast, a little bit away from the coast. And those sheep provided wool for weaving. And that's what this depiction is, is a depiction of women um, taking wool, right? Uh, combing it out, uh, spinning it, making it into thread, then weaving it and turning it into to actual fabric. So if we start at the left, they are on the very on the floor. There's a, a bale of wool. They are spinning it. Um, they have some finished garments. There's a loom here. We we can see them. They, we can see them with a the finished garment next. Then we see them spinning it into thread putting it on a weave and and then measuring and, and trading it. So, um, you know, wool was was important to um, to Egyptians. I'm sorry, to uh, Greeks. Uh, it was an important textile to Greeks. Uh, in addition to wool, um, linen was also worn and seems to have come to Egypt. I mean, come to Greece from Egypt um, and some of the, the flowier fabrics that we see, right? So in that image that we saw of Nike a few slides ago, she obviously is wearing grease, uh, wearing linen that is flowing. So you're probably like, why two fabrics, right? Because Greece is a warm, humid climate, but it also <laughs> is a cold climate. So they, they had to have seasonal garments, whereas, you know, places like India and Egypt has a pretty stable temperature. Um, you know, Greece, Greece can be cold, right? They do have mountainous regions. So they had two main, gar main textiles that they use, fabrics that they use to create their apparel because of varying climates and, and climate changes just, just during the course of, of a year. Um, in addition, silk was all, has also been found to, be, to have been produced in, in Greek, but much later much, much later than this classical period. And more, most likely it came along the Silk Road. <laughs> it came along the Silk Road from China initially. Um, and it's believed that some of the earliest garments were woven from yarns that were just unraveled from fabrics imported from China. Um, but there are native silkworms, wild silkworms that exist in the Greek peninsula. So once they understood where silk came from, there there are native silkworms that they that they can could use there as well. And of and, and cotton. Cotton again was um, brought to Greece something by the soldiers of Alexander the Great, um, but more likely just through uh, trade with the Silk Road. Okay. So again, this image that we're looking at, they're preparing wool. 
Um, they're folding cloth, they're spinning yarns, they're weaving on a, war on a warp, and then finally they're weighing, weighing that fiber, uh, th that fabric for sales. And these women are wearing, you know, form-fitting classical styles from the period. And we're going to talk about those classical styles uh, in upcoming slides.